Okay, I've got 12 o'clock, so why don't we uh, begin? I'm uh, Jeff Saltzman, CEO of Org Vitality, and the other person on the screen is Dr. Scott Brooks, who'll be the presenter today. I'll tell you a little bit about him in just a moment. Um, welcome to the webinar, a fresh look at understanding and managing turnover, blending behavioral science and, and data science. We've got some uh, logistics and setup uh, for you. First off, don't worry about uh, trying to write down all the things that Scott says. We'll be sending out copies of the overheads, uh, or overheads, I just dated myself. We'll be sending a co out copies of the slides um, after the uh, presentation today. And there will also be a recording, a link to a recording, which will be on our uh, website. Also, we're going to try and save some time at the end for questions you might have. If you look at the bottom of your screen, there should be a little um, icon that says Q&A. We'll be monitoring uh, that. If you click on that and put in your question, we'll be monitoring that throughout the uh, webinar. And hopefully, we'll have time at the end to um, uh, handle as many of those as we can. But certainly, if we run out of time, uh, we'd be very happy to follow up with you one on one and uh, answer your any questions you might have about what we've uh, covered. I think it's fair to say that uh, Scott and I were putting together this webinar. We really felt, you know, this could be a two, three, four hour kind of thing. It could be a class, uh, but we shrunk it down and hopefully we got it uh, within the time frame that we're allowing ourselves today. But there's a lot of material to cover. So let me first introduce uh, Scott to you guys. For those of you who don't know, uh, Dr. Scott Brooks is a partner and vice president of employee surveys and org vitality research at org vitality, along with myself and Natan Lerner. He was one of the founders of the company. Uh, Scott has about 30 years of experience, although he doesn't look it, of course. He consults with organizations and individuals to drive strategic change based on surveys, HR metrics, and research that eliminate the connections between leadership operations, customer loyalty, and business results. Scott is nationally recognized. Uh, people come to him all the time for advice from all over the place. Scott has consulted uh, with some of the um, very large organizations globally in such industries as high tech, retail, financial services, healthcare, not-for-profit, and other service industries. Scott, it, he's written a lot. We've done some books together over the years as well, but he's currently uh, co-authoring the employee survey chapter that's going to be coming out in the new handbook for the practice of industrial organizational psychology, which is if you went to uh, graduate school for IO, you know that is the Bible. Uh, and Scott is writing the uh, co-writing the uh, chapter on uh, surveys. Scott is a fellow in the Society of Industrial Organizational Psychology. Scott holds a PhD in industrial organizational psychology from o the Ohio State University and a Bachelor of Arts from Cornell. So Scott, and, and let me also say, Scott and I are gonna try and mix it up a little bit and we're both gonna be talking uh, uh, during this uh, presentation. But with that, let me uh, turn it over to you, Scott, to get started. Great, thanks, Jeff. You know, let me start by setting up a, a scenario that might be the kind of thing that you've heard. So, you know, this is the kind of thing that we hear, hey, you know, Scott, you know, execs have been talking about the great resignation. We have their attention. And so now's the time for something, right? What should we do? Well, what do you have in mind? Like, well, exit survey, maybe passive data meets AI, focus groups, linkage research. Like all these things are good to explore, but I think part of what this webinar is about is establishing a focus and a little framework for you to figure out uh, where to go, what to do, and, and how to start framing these things up. You know, another conversation I had recently uh, was something like this, where it was, hey, we got decent HRIS data with a lot of HR metrics sort of packed in there. It's like, check. Like, we got an annual engagement survey and a couple of life cycle survey touch points. Check, check, right? So how do you move is the question. How do you move from dashboards that present insights to efforts that actually make a difference to either improve the employee experience, or maybe more importantly, beyond the employee experience, improve organizational functioning, or even support the strategic imperatives of what the organization is really trying to do. 
All this is a tall order. Um, we're going to talk about these kinds of things, but in the context specifically of addressing employee turnover. So let's say you're sitting on a great big pile of data and a charter to explore it. Um, maybe you've heard of a new AI application that sounds so cool, but you're not quite sure about it or how it can fit in, or maybe it doesn't feel right. The question is, how do you find a place for it all? <clears throat> so I'm going to back up. It's going to sound like I'm going to take you to school a little bit, but I'm not really going to do that. I'll, be, I'll be, be gentle, I promise. But you can ask, it's like, what do we chase? Now, some of you may have heard about the four purposes of psychology or the four purposes of research. And, and uh, what I'm about to describe here is edited from that. Um, and so really, there's there's four buckets that we want to be thinking about when we're doing database exploration. Um, and the first is description, right? So what is happening? Uh, just describing it straight up. Second, prediction. Uh, what do we think will happen? Explanation, why does it happen? And action, you know, how do we control it or, or manage it? And so, you know, if we were to look about at these uh, four categories with regard to turnover, it's a pretty clear mapping. It's like, well, who's quit in what rates and, and uh, what pockets and so forth? Um, who will quit or what groups are most at risk? Uh, why will they quit? And then importantly, what can we do to prevent turnover? Um, now, by the way, I'm going to describe these as four distinct things, but, you know, when you get knee deep in the data and, and the slop that happens with, with uh, real research inside organizations, things can get a little bit messy, but let's, let's agree to be a little zen and pull back and just think about these things as, as four fairly clean buckets, even though they're, they're not exactly, but I want to describe now what this is. Uh, sorry, Jeff, go so, ahead. So I, I was just going to ask a question, Scott. So uh, you mentioned like the great resignation on the first slide. Now we've, we've heard about mm -hmm. quiet quitting. And the latest thing is, of course, quiet hiring, which I'm not even sure what mm -hmm. that is, but I'm, I'm seeing it in the, in the press. So beyond like marketing phrases, do those kind of activities, do you think, fall into these buckets as well? Or are they simply a veneer without really getting into the uh, the nuts and bolts of what's happening underneath. Well, I think it, it it highlights a good point. It's that you know probably a number of you have executives that are paying more attention and asking more questions about turnover, based on what they might be reading in the Wall Street Journal or some other um, uh, news outlet. Now that describes what the journalist happens to be talking about. It does not describe what might be happening in your organization. And so one of the things that, that it found to be true is that uh, um, like the great resignation and there was a, a conference session last year I had with a bunch of organizations and, the, and the, the general consensus was that the great resignation was overstated inside their organizations and and the hype was overblown and what was important to figure that out is a clear description in that first category about what was actually happening in their organization um, and there might have been pockets where resignations were greater so i think when you think about what's happening in the news um, you got to attach it and match it up to what's really you know a good description of your organization um, there's other things going on. The uh, media will come up with quick and dirty explanations for things that might not be the real thing uh, and so forth and so on. But I, I do want to describe and, and, and depict the differences between describe, predict, and explain and act a little bit. And I'm going to do this with a, a quick, quick set of examples. Um, so the weather. Uh, can you describe it? Well, for sure. Uh, can you predict it? Yeah, you know, decently, especially with an app on your phone. Uh, can you explain it? Well, you know, the layperson maybe, but meteorologist certainly, but can you control it? No. So those are, those are different kinds of things to think about when you think about the weather. Um, but can I control my dishwasher? 100%. Can I explain it? Maybe not. Um, can I predict it, you know, generally and kind of describe what happens? Yeah, pretty much. Um, so, the, the point here is that description, prediction, and explanation, and then action or control are, are very different things. So our challenge today is to talk about it with regard to turnover. 
Um, and, you know, how do you properly describe the lay of the land, uh, try to predict it and explain it enough in order to take actions to control what's happening there. Um, so as we articulate these again as separate, um, uh, they start to suggest a flow, right? Maybe from describe to predict or explain to act. But here's a question, uh, do we need them all? And I know Jeff, you're gonna weigh in on this a little bit in a minute, but um, one might think, and there is a traditional perspective that maybe we ought to flow in order. Uh, but I'm gonna knock that around just a little bit and, and go through a few things. So this is kind of dense, but stick with me. So what does description do? Description sets the table. Um, it characterizes the scope and the problem to solve. And without it, uh, efforts might be ungrounded. Uh, for example, if I'm up in arms about the great resignation or quiet quitting as an executive, I might say, we got to act. And I might put budget behind stuff and chart a great big projects. But if I don't really describe what's happening in my organization, I might not really know that there's a problem there, or I might not know how to focus that problem. Um, Next, I would say that prediction does not require explanation. Um, and, you know, we all know about correlation is not the same as causation, but correlation, even without causation, still has value. Um, and so if there are indicators out there in the world that come along with something, um, that still can have value. Like um, um, the one example that we have from the survey world is, is intention to quit is hands down the best predictor of actual individual level quitting that you can, if you ask that question in the survey or some version of it. Um, and we know generally in psychology that behavioral intentions predict the behavior. You know, is that really helping us understand what's going on? Not necessarily, but it's foreshadowing what might be happening and that can have a lot of value. But you can also have prediction run amok and it can lead into non-actionable or dark corners. Um, for example, if you were to turn AI on your HRIS data set and say, hey, just predict quitting, uh, it picks the variables that are important uh, in, in a machine learning kind of way. And so you can say, it's like, well, what if ethnicity becomes part of that prediction? And I'm not sure exactly which way it might predict, but, but should I be using ethnicity? Or what if um, going on maternity leave with your third kid when there's no spouse listed on your health care, is that data that you should be using? It's a kind of a good question. And what if all of that has some crazy interactions with um, uh you know, uh, uh, scraping Outlook or scraping LinkedIn and even your zip code in ways that, that you may not understand it. So it's like, we gotta be a little careful with prediction and not just what we can predict, but what are the important variables that we're gonna want um, and to use that are in our equations. So that's prediction. Explanation um, doesn't require prediction. So I can know what's going on and know what's behind a dynamic without being able to predict it. Uh, for example, uh, lightning. I can't really predict it. It just happens. But I can kind of know, thanks to Ben Franklin, about what's going on. Or maybe there's poor measurement or not great data about what you're doing in order to predict it. Um, you know, I can know what's going on. I live in California with earthquakes, but predicting them is 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 really not, 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 not a great um, domain at this point. Um, so explanation can certainly come without prediction, um, but usefulness can be diluted. Uh, you can't necessarily target the pockets that you want to target if you don't have good prediction about who might quit. And some of the understanding or the explanation might be a little different depending on those pockets. And you can certainly have action without prediction or explanation. And I know this might grate against the basic, classic, we need root cause analysis kind of message. And don't get me wrong, root cause analysis is fantastic. It's useful. Um, but there are times, to be honest, that we can create action without really understanding what's going on or being able to predict it. Uh, for example, if, if you have early turnover, um, turnover in the first 60, 90 days, 
then realistic job previews can be a great thing to implement that might help that. Um, you can talk about realistic job previews maybe in a different uh, setting. If you don't know what it is, you can Google it. It's great. Or having everybody do stay interviews. Or uh, how often have we thrown just money at people through retention bonuses in order to prevent them from quitting while we go through an acquisition or something like that? So there are ways to act, um, but it is also true that doing that without prediction risks an inefficient focus. Um, and doing it without explanation risks fixing the wrong problem, band-aid solutions, or, or simply driving around in the dark. Um, and, I, you know, I, there, there is a reality that, you know, let's face it, we act all the time without the ability to predict or explain. Uh, prediction and explanation require a certain amount of resources and effort. And so um, the point of all this is, is we should be spending our efforts on prediction and explanation uh, in a smart way and not just deem it as requirements for every action we might ever take. You know, one one thing that goes a little bit further there is we also act all the time without necessarily measuring uh, what we're taking action on. So, you know, people who say oh, today I need a haircut, you're not actually measuring the length of your hair uh, to decide you need a haircut. Right. Or, you know, when you go raid the kitchen for a midnight snack, you're not measuring, you know, how hungry are you at that moment in time? So there's lots of things that we take action upon, not only that we're not predicting or can't explain, but also we're not even measuring, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so anyway, this begins to set up the frame. And uh, certainly for the most important things you do, uh, you want some in each of these prongs, each of these components. And so, you know, how do we go about doing this? And I'm going to talk about a, a smart blending of disciplines. And certainly there's many disciplines that we could bring to bear to address these topics. I'm going to focus on two of the biggies, right? Um, so across describe, predict, explain, and act, uh, one of the things we have is data science. Um, so raise your virtual hand if you want, uh, or just sit up straighter in your chair if you've been asked about data science or there's been queries or expectations in your jobs of somehow either understanding or even executing something related to data science or going out and buying something. Um, now, it's important to get a little definition here. Uh, data science, uh, there is some buzzwordiness to it. Um, there might not be a super common uniform definition that exists in the planet right now. But generally speaking, it's all about extracting patterns and insights from big and noisy data sets, often focused on uh, machine learning or AI kinds of tools. And data science tends to live in prediction. And I'm going to describe that a little bit more as we go forward. But it's all about what can we identify in our data as patterns and what can we predict and maybe what outcomes uh, can we can we figure out how to um, um, you know well, predict and foreshadow and understand um, the behavioral science on the other hand tends to live in explanation and even explain is part of the really common definition now behavioral science is older than data science and so it has a little more of a stable and well accepted definition which is essentially. Uh, something like this about seeking to understand and explain human decisions, behavior, and social interactions. So in that definition, it's moving towards interactions or action um, from explanation. And so um, these two disciplines live at slightly different parts of this framework. And just to drill into this a little bit more deeply, you know, data science is often defined by the tools. It's it's AI or a technique or machine learning or something else. Whereas behavioral science is often defined by the goal or what it's trying to do. Um, and so anyway, I just want to plant these two definitions here as two different things um, because we need to incorporate the best of both worlds as we go forward. And Scott, would you, would you say there's some tension in organizations between sort of the advocates of data science and the advocates of behavioral science, you know, that we see yeah. 
we see a push and a pull and and who's has more influence in the organization at any one time might be one group versus the other, right? Yeah, and 100%. Uh, first of all, everybody on the planet now knows data science and will toss that word out even without having a clear definition. Uh, not everybody thinks in terms of behavioral science. So A, the brand of data science is new, shiny, fast, um, and so forth. And if there is a brand for behavioral science, it might be more, you know, tweed jackets with holes in the elbows and a pipe in front of a fire with a basset hound, it seems kind of stayed maybe slow. But setting that aside, there are some new things in behavioral science that, that are a little shiny and glitzy, like uh, the behavioral economics or, or nudging, right? Um, it's a maturing and people are figuring out what does this mean in organizations, but it's, it's got a little bit more of a brand right now than just behavioral science in general. But if there is a, a distinction or a, a, a tension, it's sometimes that people use the tools and the shininess of data science and expect some of the outcomes for action that maybe behavioral science might give you. Um, like, you know, in reality, I would say that AI doesn't care um, if the predictions it makes make sense. Uh, but people do. And when you make people decisions, they want a story behind it. You can't just say to somebody, hey, sorry, you're not getting hired. It's like, well, how come? Well, that the algorithm didn't pick you out of the pile. And it's like, that's not satisfying and not useful and handy. People want a little bit more of an explanation. Um, but, you know, it, it, if we've all been there where we've had great and well executed projects, um, where we focus maybe a little bit too much on the description and prediction. Um, and there's a, a statement that I like to make, which is, you know, dashboards don't create change, people do. And on some level, and Jeff, this hits maybe to your question, uh, data science is all about creating an insight or a prediction or something that you could put in a dashboard. It doesn't take the next steps to go off and do something about that. I don't know if that addresses the kind of thing you had in mind, but um, yeah, you, you, you nicely led into my next slide. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so anyway, data science can't take us all the way. And, you know, the action part is really the domain of people science. So if we were to move ahead for a second here, we can say, you know, where do we get the data to describe, predict, and explain employee turnover? And the answer is many places. Um, and certainly there's some traditional stuff with uh, surveys and, and whatnot, but there's some new things that are out there that, that are more passive data related. Uh, and there's, there's plenty of you know, knee jerks and, and managerial you know, risk assessments of their direct reports and so forth. Um, it might be that, that y'all are swimming in more data than you can handle, uh, but I'm gonna talk about just a few sort of data sources as it relates to some of these things. So the first is HRIS systems, which, you know, it's like, where can you start? You can start here. Um, and generally speaking, HRIS systems are great at describing who's quitting. Um, and maybe you have uh, good definitions of regrettable turnover baked into your HRIS system. Um, and one of the things, though, that's very important is uh, a lot of times there'll be people who say, you know what, our, our high potentials are quitting. And it's like, okay, you know, um, that's fine. Or, you know, our, our women software engineers are quitting. It's like, okay, that, that's important. Let's focus on that. And then if you ask them, it's like, well, how do female software engineers quit rates compare to male engineers? It's like, oh, we didn't look at that. It's like, it's really important that when you describe things, you have comparison groups. So you figure out, is this a software engineering turnover item? Is this a gender-based turn turnover issue? Or is this just a company-wide kind of turnover issue? Um, so uh, don't just look at, you know, who's quitting and say, oh, yeah, let's focus on them. You got to have some comparisons to try to isolate and focus the problem. Now, can HRI systems predict? Yeah, maybe. Um, but there, there can be certainly factors in that HRS data, like uh, time since last promotion or something like that, or use of on-site daycare is a great retention system. I mean, what 
parent, especially a new parent, wants to pull their kid out of any daycare. And if it's on site, then fabulous. Um, now, granted, this is a little bit of a pre-pandemic uh, kind of illustration, but I think you can you can figure that out. Um, now, does HRIS systems explain data? It's no, it's mostly bio data. And for those of you familiar with their term, the, the term bio data, you know about how using it in selection can can work great, um, but there's no theory. It's sort of dust bowl empiricism, and so it doesn't doesn't necessarily tell a story behind it. Um, so. HRIS, great place to start, especially for the description. Well, what else we got? Um, what about AI? Uh, and where does that fit in? And how do we, you know, feed it whatever it wants to eat? Um, you know, what's the deal with this? And maybe you've heard of tools that might scrape Outlook or LinkedIn or look at, you know, folks that are clocking in just a little bit later than they always used to for their own personal average and, and things like that that can predict uh, turnover. It's like, well, that can be useful, you know, and, and it it's, it flags a certain amount of risk and, and that's intriguing. But whether it's passive data or not, you know, let's talk for a second about AI. Uh, can it describe the issue? It's like, Maybe, but humans will need to filter to what's important. Uh, sometimes AI can over-describe or characterizes things that are maybe statistically true, but not really relevant or useful or interpretable. Um, can and, AI predict? Oh, go ahead, Jeff. I was just saying, one of the things that we know is coming out about AI in terms of describing is there are inherent biases into the algorithms uh, within AI. So as it describes things or predicts things, right, there are sometimes biases built into the system. Yeah, there's a, I mean, it's, if there's, if the data that AI is using is historic, um, uh, which by nature it's going to be, I mean, it can be like almost not historic, it can be really close to present, but generally it's historic. If there are biases in that data set, that will be reflected reflected in the uh, predictions. Uh, there's a great little example you can do with your iPhone and opening up a text with the predictive um, words. Uh, and uh, I'll just say this really briefly. You can Google it or ask me later. But if you say the nurse said that, there's a good chance that the next word predicted uh, by your iPhone. Android doesn't do this as much. Yeah, you're welcome, Android users. But there's a good chance the next word is going to be you know, said that she. And so there's a gendered nature to the predictive words that your iPhone is going to tell you. And, and that's statistically true because it's looking at the last 50 years of, of you know, lexicological indexing um, where, you know, nurses tended to be associated more with gendered pronouns, female gendered pronouns, but that might not be where you want to go in the future. That's just sort of a, a little example. But when we talk about prediction though, um, this is AI's sweet spot, uh, whether it's individual or group level data or no problem, passive data, bring it on. Um, and particularly if the outcome is binary, like quit or not quit uh, in paradigm, right? It, it's something that has been happening over the last uh, certain amount of time, like, you know, turnover has been happening. Um, certainly pandemic turnover, a little more out of paradigm when we hit that. Um, but under normal circumstances, you know, that it's very... Um, well defined. Um, and, you know, if what you want to know is echoed in some data set somewhere, then throw AI at it and, and go nuts and you can get some great prediction. Um, does it explain? Eh, you know, AI is all about maximizing prediction and doesn't inherently care if, if it makes sense or not. Um, you know, which is fine for some applications, particularly um, is that mole on you skin cancer? Well, you don't care about the why behind it. You just want to know if it is. Is that charge in your visa bill bank fraud? Um, you know, AI is awesome for determining things where the backstory doesn't really matter. You just want to know it's something about to happen. Um, but it's, it's just generally great at prediction. Now, just one quick note about this. Um, there is a creepy line, and uh, this is something more for long coffee chats potentially, but if you're using data that employees do not consciously give, right, uh, like passive data and so forth, um, for, as opposed to like a survey where employees are giving data and sort of know that you're going to be using it, 
Um, and if the analysis is to predict turnover risk at an individual level, which can be an important question. Like I got a succession plan. Is my backfill for my CFO at a flight risk or not? Um, but when you're trying to do that, you start to edge closer to a creepy line. And so issues of not just can I predict, but should I predict based off of privacy policies or or such is important. And there's a, a, a general rule of thumb that helps get that thinking started, which is, would you stand up in front of a room full of employees at a podium up front and be proud to describe what you're doing with their data? Um, if not, you know, give it some thought. I mean, there are some times where we want to be a little bit more secretive. Um, I don't want to get controversial right now, but if you got impending layoffs and something like that, you don't want to um, announce that too broadly, too early. But at the same time, um, would you feel proud to describe what you're doing with employees' data? And would they say, "Yeah, that makes sense"? Um, so think about it that way. You know, one of the one of the things I've noticed with sort of the approach of data science versus behavioral science. And I think when we talk about some other methods, it'll come out some more. There is pressure uh, to go down to an N of one. Uh, in many cases where going down to an N of one may or may not be appropriate, it may not be appropriate. And yet the uh, organization says, you know, I don't want you to tell me that the sales group is at risk for cru for uh, quitting. I want you to tell me who within the sales group. And you're really beginning to cross into violations of some privacy. If you think about it from a behavioral science standpoint, if you think about it from a data science standpoint, when I've talked to data scientists, they never talk about minimum ends. They like, yeah, let's drill in and find out exactly who's going to quit. So there's, a, again, a tension there between some of the uh, approaches. And I, I Scott, curious as to whether you've seen that as well. Yeah, I, I think that's true. I think um, data science is emergent and it's cool. Um, and it's sometimes um, carried away by what it can do, uh, not what it should do. Uh, and behavioral science is a little older. You know, there's uh, more sort of professional standards and uh, ethical guidelines and things like that that are underneath it, um, and it's it's maybe comes from more of a of a distinct set of disciplines um, where you know you're focused on people and the impacts on people. Um, but um, I, I think that's right. And you know, let me illustrate a little bit about what AI is like. And this is one of my favorite illustrations I run across. And and let's just acknowledge from the get go, get go that AI does not process like a human. And so here's an example. This is what we see. What, what do we see here? We see uh, a bowl of fruit with a dollop of cream on top and a spoon in a bowl, right? Uh, what does AI see? If you give this to an AI system, it might try to parse it apart, you know, pattern match and count and sort. That's what AI does. That's what computers do. And so this is what AI sees. And so you look at that and you kind of go, all right, um, first of all, note that the polka dots are indistinguishable from the fruit on some level. Um, but there's a very important lesson underlying this, which is purpose matters. If I am asking the AI system to evaluate that bowl of fruit and would it make a great still life to paint, um, how does it evaluate and and judge and score the aesthetic balance maybe of what's in there? Uh, you could probably make an AI program that would do that. What if, on the other hand, I'm a nutritionist and I wanted to know the, the sort of nutritional content of what's in this bowl? You could have AI counted up kind of like the picture on the, the right and uh, it can figure out what's a banana and what's a kiwi and so forth. And it could index that against other data about nutritional content. It could figure that out. But the underlying point here is that asking the right questions matters more, not less with AI. Um, we cannot abdicate our responsibilities of driving towards action uh, to data scientists um, and to just people in the back office because, you know, you can ask, for example, who will quit? 
And foreshadowing a, a point later in this, or, in this webinar, you can also ask a question, how can we maintain our organizational competencies through a volatile employment landscape? That might be a better question, or maybe not just who will quit, but what can be done now to prevent future quitting? These are different questions, and to frame them up differently to AI would produce different answers. And so you 100% need to sit down and say, not just the knee jerk who will quit, but what are we really trying to do here? What, what is the problem we're trying to solve? It's not just, I don't want people to break up with us because that makes us sad. It's um, people that quit um, take away from the value of the organization in some way. And what is it that that's happening here? Um, so we might move more towards you know, some explanations or some thinking about the underlying questions. And so it helps if we have a model or a framework. And, and this is one, it, it happens to be one of my favorites for turnover where, um, you know, there's four, four, three forces, excuse me. Um, there's a push, I don't like it here. I'm dissatisfied, maybe disengaged. Um, there is friction, which is switching costs. You know, what does it take to pull stakes and actually move to a new job? It's that is not to be underestimated. Um, and actually, my example of, of daycare earlier, on-site daycare, it's a great thing that keeps people around. It has nothing to do with not liking it here or uh, vesting in a 401k or something like that. But then there's also pull towards an alternative. Um, what else am I going to do? Am I going back to school? Am I finding another job and so forth? And all these three forces sort of line up. Sometimes we get a little too smitten in our work thinking about the push or the media in talking about great resignation that, oh, it's because everybody's disengaged. And nothing to do, they never talk about the, the fact that the employment was, um, uh, uh, macroeconomic conditions were kind of going nuts and lots of jobs were opening up. So the pull was really strong. They don't talk about that. Um, so it's important to have a model that helps you frame up the questions that, you know, so how do you track and influence these forces, right, is, is kind of what you're doing. So, this might naturally suggest uh, going to an exit survey. So another data source you could look at, you know, what does an exit survey do? Um, does it describe? Sure. Uh, it describes the opinions of those people as they're leaving, which, you know, is one point in time, but it's, it's a great point in time. Uh, and you can get particularly good information about the decision process to quit or the pull towards our alternatives. Where, where are they going? What are they doing? And what did it take to overcome the switching costs? Does it predict? Well, not really, because you're already just talking only to the quitting people and there's no longitudinal or co concurrent comparison group, right? There's no, if everybody talks about pay, you can't just conclude that um, pay is what's making people quit because maybe everybody in the company is complaining about pay. Um, or um, does it explain? It's like, well, somewhat, but it's almost like a, the way a focus group explains this is there's still no um comparison to the stayers necessarily now you may be thinking that it's like well if i use my exit survey data in conjunction with other surveys i can actually get some comparison groups and you'd be right um which illustrates the point that two things used together can magnify the value so we're never just going to have one tool or one data source in isolation so the point is going to be to, to, to create the, the mosaic of what really helps. Um, one last example here about, you know, where do you find data is, well, what if I use a, an annual census survey and subsequent data turnover? And this is really focused on a slightly different question than who will quit, but more what can be done months ahead of time to prevent regrettable quits? What does that look like? Here's a quick illustration where you got, you know, year one, um, let's say it's an annual survey. It can be whatever you want it to be, but there's the survey administration. Then you got this year's worth of people that are quitting. And then at year two, you could compare basically the people who quit versus the people who didn't based off of their year one um, survey results. You know, And so a year ago, what differences in those scores would have foreshadowed or predicted the turnover? And um, we can say, you know, hey, does this describe Sure, you know, it builds from some known descriptions in HRS about that bundle of people who quit in the middle. Um, does it predict? Yeah, uh, it's got the longitudinal aspect built in. So it's not just prediction in the sense that, you know, any regression equation can predict, but 
I could use today's weather to predict yesterday's weather in a regression equation. I know that's a little esoteric point. Let's not worry too much about that. But I can. What, what this does is this predicts forward in time, and that's that's sometimes um, you got to listen to the, how people use the word predict because it doesn't always mean what we, we sort of assume it means, and you know it doesn't always mean like predicting forward in time. But this this methodology definitely is predicting forward in time, and does it explain? Yeah, it can, especially if your um, census survey has a lot of the companion things in there that might describe the story behind the push or, you know, is it lack of involvement or lack of career growth or or something else going on? Um, you know, and, and it can help elaborate beyond just this straight up engagement centric story. Um, it can go behind that to describe more of the why. Um, one of the main points that I've been sort of driving to with this is that it's it should not be an either or with all these data or tools, and you want to blend together uh, efforts that will help. And again, the best efforts will be some sort of mosaic of data sources and disciplines. Um, AI's got some limitations, but we should know those limitations and then 100% use AI. Uh, behavioral science has some limitations, but we should know those and also use that because they do kind of different things. And so something that, that's also very important to acknowledge uh, a reality, which is, hey, what if you can't control turnover? You know, um, what if you, you can predict maybe? Um, and what if you can explain it, but you just, there's nothing you can really do to stem the tide. And, um, you know, certainly that's going to be a big chunk of what turnover is. Uh, where no action seems to work, even if built on a great foundation of, you know, description, prediction, explanation, and action. So we're going to add a fifth component here. Um, and, you know, we don't need a pandemic or a war or a tumultuous economic environment to tell us that turnover can just happen. And so the last fifth component here is going to be managed. And the big question here is, given that at least some of it's inevitable, how to reduce the impact of it. And so this is part of what you're chasing when you're trying to understand and act on turnover. It's not just straight up who will quit. It's not just straight up what do we know, you know, months ahead of time that could prevent future quitting. It's how can we manage the turnover that's going to happen anyway. And so just a, a quick illustration about managing issues you can't control the weather. What do you do if it's going to be cold? Well, or rainy, you, you dress for it. You, know, you bring an umbrella or you adapt your plans or you can move to Hawaii. There's any number of things you can do to manage the weather um, that's going to be coming at you. And so employee turnover, there's a lot of things you can do. Um, you can maintain a strong recruiting pipeline. You can improve ramp up speed. You can scale processes, right? Um, McDonald's restaurants is a good example where on a lot of ways, it's like, yeah, they got high turnover. Yeah, they expected. Yeah, if they nobody ever quit, then people would ratchet up through the pay ranges and it would become sort of expensive to pay people. But if you've been to McDonald's, you know, one of the things you know is that the value is created by the beeps and buzzers and the uh, controlled processes. It's not created by the unique contributions of, of creative individuals, let's say. Um or even in a knowledge work situation like a law firm, uh, there's a lot of effort to try to work on uh, knowledge management systems and other things to help make turnover less impactful when it does happen. Um, and so one of the things that you're really trying to do here, and I alluded to this a bit earlier, is you're trying to manage not simply towards individuals and prevention of quitting, but you're managing toward the competencies of the organization. Um, and this ought to be triggering some new questions in your heads, you know, uh, new outcomes to maybe describe, predict, or explain. Like, how do you make sure to keep all the capabilities in play that the organization needs to keep the wheels turning, right? Um, even if people quit. And that's a different question. And you could start to stick AI or your best behavioral science brains onto that. And this is, this is fantastic. It, it's a new way to start to think about um, turnover and you know, uh and what you're really trying to do you know a little uh variation on that which i think you implied but you didn't come out and directly and say it is that there are some organizations that not only 
sort of want to describe and can and predict the turnover, but they want turnover. Uh, mm-hmm. You know, if you go back to the law firms, it's up or out, right? They they don't want people sticking around who aren't going to hit certain performance targets, as you said, like places like McDonald's and and other you know low end kind of places. They expect um, people to leave as a way of controlling costs. Right, to bring in an entry level person and pay them an entry level uh, rate, and the person who's been there five years, they should move. You know, the expectation is they should move on uh, to something else. So, there are organizations that are trying to reduce turnover, but there are also some organizations that actually want to encourage a certain amount of turnover among certain groups. Yeah, yeah there's another. Sure. There's another um, uh, thing that occurs to me here, where you talk about. You're managing not simply the individual, but maintaining the competencies of the organization. You know, there's some organizations out there that sort of um, live by or celebrate the hero. You know, the person who uh, goes way above and beyond in order for the for the organization to accomplish their goals. And there's nuances here that we can get into, but essentially, what we're saying is. Heroes, you know, I wrote a piece a long time ago called The Hero Fallacy. If the organization is depending on the hero, the individual to be successful, it means the organization is not doing a very good job in managing the systematizing of its work processes. So Mm -hmm. that comes into play here as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. For sure. Um, So I think what Jeff, you were saying, and, and I think sort of the, the meta point that, that you're articulating well is um, zero turnover is not usually the goal, um, and even zero regrettable turnover uh, might need to be tolerated and has side effects that are good for the organization. Um, but ultimately, what you're trying to do is not just reduce turnover, you're trying to keep the competencies in the organization um, that don't just reside within a single person, but are institutionalized or, or other kinds of things like that. Um, so, you know, I, we're survey people, uh, as Jeff sort of alluded to in the intro and, you know, spend my, a lot of my career doing this. So there is a little bit of a, how can we use surveys to do these things? And there's a lot I think in this um, slide, and I'm not really gonna go over all of it, but it'll be in the materials that you can look at. But I do wanna highlight one thing, which is that you might not think that a survey can help you manage turnover um, in that fifth category, inevitable turnover. But you could think about, and I'm on the second row here on the last cell on the right, that content in your turnover, uh, content in your survey um, that addresses things like workload or scalability or the impact of churn can 100% be there. So if this is one of your top survey goals, um, and surveys never have a single goal, right? Um, But if if, um, managing the impact of turnover and churn is one of your big goals, you can you can lean into that and you can use surveys and other data sources to help you figure that out. Um, and um, so, you know, unless, Jeff, you feel like there's something here you want to highlight, I'm going to move on to help close us out um, okay. with a, a summary slide. Go ahead. So if we were to take this down then to sort of one big one page summary, and there's a lot going on here. Um, but there's like a question for you here. Um, you know, where do your efforts need to mature? And so breaking it out into the five prongs here with each one has a question. What's the place of data science and behavioral science or nudging? And, and what data sources and tools might you apply to different places? And, you know, I'm, I'm sure you could add more disciplines uh, in here besides just data science and behavioral science, you know, strategic leadership. Um, process engineering, you know, OD is kind of a behavioral science, um, depending on how people arrive there, uh, or other types of things in their behavioral economics I've alluded to. So there, there's a lot of other disciplines, but but really, I just wanted to highlight here in this um, 
webinar, the, the, the two broadly data science, behavioral science, but you can add other things here. Um, and you could add other tools and other ways to gather data. But in the end, know that these different disciplines will touch these different prongs differently. And in the end, you need people to be doing something different than what they were doing um, you know, before you had an intervention here. So I think this is a great time to pause and check in on some questions. Um, Jeff, you might have some, but I will note that in the Q&A, um, uh, back when talking about AI, there was a comment made, which was um, AI prediction bias can certainly be insidious. If your company culture is having trouble retaining minorities, AI will happily advise you to reduce, reduce turnover by hiring more white people. And it's like, well, yeah, that's true. Um, um, so I think there is a, a reality to making sure that you um, understand what's happening in AI. I, I like to, to think about AI as you, you want to evaluate its output the same way you'd evaluate the work output of a new employee. Um, check, check the work, uh, give it some squint test and make sure that it feels right before you dive into it. Jeff, are there any questions coming in? Well, the, the one thing that I've, I've got is about scalability. Uh, it seems that the data science piece of this gives the behavioral science the ability to really scale up. So uh, when I think of it, uh, you know, years ago when we did an executive presentation of our findings on a research project, you know, you would labor over that for weeks in terms of, you know, putting the final touches on a presentation that you thought brought out the main points and, and yet would uh, have impact in a positive way for the organization. Uh, what data science allows the possibility is for the 10,000 managers within that organization to get that same kind of information that used to be limited to the executive team. Uh, is that a true statement, do you think? Or is that, do you think that's where these things begin to come together also? Yeah, you know, I, I think it, it's like, th that's where they're sort of hand in hand. And, and in a way I think about like for the executive presentation thing that you're talking about, where you're trying to craft a story that helps um, executives understand and discuss and sort of focus differently based off of a survey. And if you think about AI there, it's it's sort of like, you know, maybe there's still a human story to tell, but an AI gives you a much better radar to see what's in the air and, and what's happening, what's around you, um, you know, down to the texture of the, you know, valleys five miles away and that kind of stuff. And so, and then you can decide what are the blips on the radar that you want to raise to executives? So there's still this, this sort of interpretive nature, but it's like the, the, the landscape is, can be much better mapped. Um, and in terms of scalability, you know, another example that I know you know about is, um, you know, in terms of asking questions, let's, let's talk about survey and text analytics for a second. Um, one thing that we like to say is, yeah, you can look at sentiment and that's what a lot of people like to do in open-ended comments is, well, what's the sentiment? It's like, okay, fine. You know, I already know if somebody is fairly happy or sad based on all the scaled items. I don't need a, to look at a sentiment of a comment typically. So it's like, what really gets used? What drives action in an open-ended comment? And you can think about, um, you know, if, if your question is, you know, what would be a great idea to improve X, you know, improve this organization, then maybe what you want mostly is to find the nuggets in there that are some of the best ideas. And so one of the things we've done is we've created a usefulness quotient where we have human coded the usefulness of comments and then used algorithms and, and different kinds of analyses and, and AI to figure out what are the best predictors of a useful comment. And the action there is basically to sort those to the top of the list and have people read the more useful ones first. You know. So there's, that's a way to scale um, a little bit of consultative wisdom into an algorithm. And I think that's the kind of thing you're talking about. And so 
in both these examples, the presentation and the open-ended comments, it's like there's got to be a brain sort of figuring out what are we really trying to do? What are the best questions here? Um, and then you employ the best data science tools you can to uh, help that happen or behavioral science uh, nuggets you can to help make that happen. Thank you. But one of the things I forgot to mention to everybody, uh, well, we got a, another question just popped in before we go to that. Uh, does conventional science go in the order, describe, explain, predict, then act? This means formulating mm -hmm. hypothesis to explain what's going on and using this to predict outcomes, which you can test by experiment before acting. Yeah, um, that's 100% true. You know, I, I mentioned at the beginning that, that there's like these four purposes of research that talks about these. And and um, um, I think that's science is, I mean, that's great. I mean, that's true. That's for science, you know, creating organizational change is a little different. I mean, we certainly have that fifth one managed that doesn't quite exist in, in the scientific, you know, framework. Um, and, you know, we also know that prediction has value just all by itself, even if there's no explanation to it. Um, like if I just know what pockets are more likely to turn over, maybe I don't know why, but there might be something I can do. Um, and so anyway, I, I, I it's absolutely true for conventional science. And um, but sometimes uh, we want to embrace the messiness of uh, organizational realities and embrace new tools like, you know, AI that strays a little bit from that. Um, so 100% true, but I think we're chasing, it's like we're kind of aligned, but slightly focused on different targets. Yeah, thank you. So one thing I wanted to mention is as you exit the survey or as the webinar today, there will be a brief survey We'd appreciate it if you uh, took a minute to fill it out. It will help us improve on our webinars going forward. And second, Scott, if you can advance, we want to invite you. Um, yeah, submit your questions, right? We want to invite you to our next webinar, March 14th, 12 o'clock. Scott and I will be presenting on what's a strategic approach to the employee experience. What does that mean? Uh, if you go to our website, you'll be able to register for this March uh, 14th webinar. So with that, um, I think it's I'd like to thank you all from uh, for coming. It's I hope you found it uh, valuable. It's uh, a new topic for us, but I, I think uh, I learned a lot working with Scott pulling this together. Uh, so thanks for your time, everybody. And um, any last words, Scott? Yeah, just that, you know, as you're formulating your questions and what to predict and what to explain, be thinking about what kind of actions you're able to take or want to take and how you're going to manage the impact of turnover and then back up into the explanations and, you know, the, the, defining the targets through description and explanation and prediction. Um, so it's, it's another way to sort of start at the end in mind. Um, but just starting with a question like, hey, who's going to quit? It's like, that might be the perfect question, but you might be able to come up with a better questions. And I think I would challenge you to do so. So um, okay. appreciate the time, everybody. Um, thank you very much. And Thanks, everybody. Have a good rest of your day. Bye-bye.